Hello everyone, in this video we'll be improving the look of our game with a couple of easy tricks. Amongst them is post-processing, but we're also going to look at a couple of different things to improve your game. Now for this purpose I'm using one of my own games that is not finished yet, so don't judge too harshly. And before we get started I'd like to thank all of my Patreon supporters for the absolutely amazing support. Now if you have a look at the character you'll see localized shadows on the right and not so much on the left. That's because we're using ambient occlusion. It's one of the most important effects really. And ambient occlusion really is just a simulation of shadows on 3D objects. Turning this on or off makes a huge difference. In a bit you'll see that on the asteroids as well. Whereas on the right you'll see depth in the shadow craters and you won't see that on the left. Another thing we're using is LUTs, and LUTs basically are pre-made color grading filters and they make a big difference if you want to quickly get the right look for your game. We're also using a couple of other assets and we'll delve into how to use them. We'll also look at other post-processing effects. So let's get started and dive in. So the first thing we're going to do is we'll be using uh, post-processing effects to add all of the basics really and we're expanding this by using another asset as well which gives you additional post-processing effects. Now first things first and you don't really need uh, any effects applied to really notice the difference. By default we'll see a lot of jaggies and as you can see it's uh, yeah, it's not pretty. So what we'll do here, and you'll see one of the other assets we'll be using as well, which is Aura 2. Um, but we'll delve into that a bit later. So you add the post-processing layer, and the first thing you do is turn on FXAA, which is the well, cheapest solution, really. Um, SMAA is another um, anti-aliasing effect. I actually, it's supposed to be a bit heavier. Um, I'm actually, you know, getting a bit mixed results when I turn it on. Uh, I know FXAA uh, blurs the edges a lot, which might not be exactly what you're going for, um, but overall it's pretty lightweight and I do think it looks better. Now, temporal anti-aliasing uh, gives completely different types of effects and it actually has an impact on the type of post-processing effects you're using, the type of textures you're using, um, you'll have to have a look at what works better for you. So for example, if you have really highly detailed um, and really sharp uh, terrain textures, um, there's actually quite a big difference with, between the anti-aliasing effects you can use. So I definitely recommend playing around with that, seeing what works better for you. Um, by default, I just use FXAA, but um, if you're going for a really realistic um, you know, project, uh, it might not actually be the best option for you. And you'll see what I mean once you, once you actually try it out and use those terrain uh, textures or building textures. So first things first, we're, uh, we're setting this up. Then next up, uh, you need to select a filter which will use the post-processing effects, uh, a layer. Now I created one myself, which I simply call post-process plain and simple and the way you do this is you go to layer and you add one if you don't have it and that's pretty much all there is to it then next thing we're doing is we're adding an empty and we'll call this post process and then you add a post process volume now, as you can see, there's a difference between is global, um, blend, distance, weight, priority. Now, what does all of this mean? Um, well, you can have localized post-process volumes. If you, um, something you'll see quite often in a game, actually, that when you enter a room, the color grading changes. Um, if it's a chemical plant, for example, which has toxic waste, the color grading might turn a bit greenish. And that can be done by adding a collider, so a uh, trigger. So if you add a box collider, for example, um, and add it to trigger, then you can have a localized post-processing volume, which is pretty cool. So you can set that for just a room, for example. Uh, pretty interesting. 
and something you'll most likely be using at some point. Uh, blend distance uh, literally allows you to blend between those uh, different volumes you might have. Now, if you have a localized volume and a normal volume, which we'll be setting up now, uh, you'll need to add the priority as well. So the localized volume needs to have a higher priority. So for now, I'm just going to do is global. You'll see that blend distance is turned off as well because there's nothing to blend with. And um, we'll create a new profile. Now, the nice thing with profiles is that these are files um, which are stored. So if you have a project with a really nice profile you like to use again, uh, you can simply copy that over. So that's pretty cool. Now we're going to add some effects and we're going to start off um, with the one I mentioned before, which is ambient occlusion. And let's actually go a bit inside of our building here and let's have a look at the effects this has. So we have a couple of 3D objects, a couple of props here. So we're going to add ambient occlusion and We'll, um, or we'll turn it on. So multi-scale, intensity, uh, thickness modifier. We have all of these options. Now I'm going to keep it as black um, because well, it's, it's a shadow and it makes, uh, works best here. And if I increase this value after I, uh, let me turn on the layer first. So this needs to be that set layer we did before. So if I increase this value, you'll see the localized shadows happening. Now, obviously, a really high value um, will just look ridiculous. And yeah, it doesn't really work. Now, you will most likely be um, changing these values a bit after adding the other effects. That's something that's quite important to point out. Um, it's really hard to get the perfect look for you right now without having added the other effects. So for now, I'm just going to add a 0 0.5, for example. And as you can see, we have some localized shadows now. So if you look under the cart, um, you know, the back, these objects, um, we'll have some localized shadows. And it, you know, adds a lot of atmosphere straight away. And let's have another example here where we actually check out one of these asteroids. Perfect. So, if I go back to my post-process layer and I turn this off, you'll see that there are no localized shadows. And here in those craters, we immediately get some localized shadows. And the higher this value goes, the bigger those shadows are. But yeah, it, uh, it helps a lot. It adds a lot of depth to your scene. So pretty cool. And let's go back to our scene here. So there we go. So we've added ambient occlusion. Let's close this off. So we have ambient occlusion now. Then next thing we're going to do, and by the way, if you don't tick these boxes, it doesn't mean they don't work. It literally just means that um, you're not changing any of the values. That's, that's literally it. Now we have multi-scale and scalable ambient occlusion as well. And they have a bit of a different effect, as you can see with Scalable. Um, there's a lot more options in terms of what you can, uh, can adjust. Um, which is pretty cool. The problem with uh, Scalable, for me anyway, was that it didn't look right in uh, other scenes, so like uh, planets, etc. And it's, it's really specific and you have to tweak it well. And as you can see, it has a different type of effect on different types of types of objects. So that's why I went well with multi-scale and it's just more consistent and easier to get a decent look. It's, might, might be a bit less precise but it just works better because otherwise you can get some strange results but you know try it out and see what works better for you. Then the next thing we're going to add is color grading. Oh. And there we go. Now, color grading has tons of options, and I'm not using most because I am using uh, lots. And um, with color grading, we have um, the most important thing here. Um, none, neutral, 
which if you look closely has a tiny bit of an effect, not really. Um, but Aces has a really big effect and that's pretty clear straight away. As you can see it's a lot darker. And Aces is a color grading profile that is used by default um, in the, I think it was the movie industry or something like that. Um, but, you know, as you can see, it makes things really, really dark and that, you know, causes some issues. Now we can um, counteract that here by uh, cranking up the post exposure. But um, we're going to take a different uh, approach, which has a bit more customization options. But as you can see, this is something that does work. And turning that on or off um, actually still has a really big impact on how the scene looks. So it does look a lot more cinematic-y. I don't know how you'd, uh, how you'd say that. But yeah, I'm going to turn this, uh, turn this off, put it back to zero, because we're going to counteract this in more, uh, a better way. So we're going to add the next, which is auto exposure. And auto exposure has, well, you know, a lot of options. Um, <clears throat> but basically it will allow us a bit better to, uh, to counteract the effects of what we did with the ACES profile. So um, we'll keep the filtering the way it is. And we're going to crank up these values a bit. Um, so going to do this the other way around and we're going to counteract it this way so we're doing as you can see the exposure um, exposure compensation is really similar to what we had here uh, but we can have minimal and maximal values and it just gives a bit um, bit slightly better results uh, compared to just using what you have in color grading I'm not going to pretend it's the biggest uh, difference, but considering that both the default uh, post-processing uh, effects, you know, might as well use it as it does give slightly better results. So, yeah, now we have that and just, you know, let's just turn it off so we can actually see what we're doing right here. As you can see, this looks really, I mean, it looks fine-ish. Um, but you know it's quite obvious we uh, in terms of shadows there's not a lot of shadows um, we're already getting a better look now I'm going to move to a different room here um, to show off the next effect let's rotate this camera a tiny bit and the next effect is going to influence lights now bloom is what it is called and yes this might not be the most popular effect and I know it's been overused a lot in video games um, but it still has um, quite a bit of value in my opinion so as you can see the game I'm creating is a game set in space and um, you know the effect Bloom has here is that it really you know perks up those lights so let me show you what I mean and if you play the game like Mass Effect, for example, um, it's really hard to imagine, um, you know, Mass Effect's look without having Bloom present. Bloom is just, you know, quite important. Um, so yeah, let's add the effect, um, Bloom. And um, in terms of Bloom, we're going to uh, change a couple of things, not all that much. Um, really not all that much. I, uh, well... I'll turn everything on just to show you what it does, uh, but I'm not really using that much of it. And um, as you can see, so have a look at the lights and you know, the brighter it is, the brighter all of the lights are. Now, what are these lights? So these light sources are, um, you know, part of the uh, material. So these are, uh, let me open one up so you can actually have a look. So these are the emissive, uh, you know, values in the uh, materials, so in the textures. Yes, it has an effect on normal lights as well, but it has the most amount of effect on emission in materials. So quite important to keep in mind. And that's where it really has an effect. Now, if you completely turn off Bloom, to be fair, these don't even look like lights. They look like, I don't know, just, you know, white stripes really 
Um, so turning on and increasing the, the bloom value um, basically makes them act like proper lights. Now this might already be a bit, uh, a bit too much and a bit too intense for your taste. Um, but yeah, that's what it does. So um, as you can see with the threshold, um, these are the values in which um, you know the bloom is uh, really present. So if it's uh, you know non-existent, um, it's even brighter. But I'm just going to keep this at the defa uh, default value. Uh, now you can you know again really change uh, all of these parameters. I didn't play around too much with it because whatever I tried to change, it just had a kind of a negative effect. Now, um, the anamorphic ratio, literally, as you can see, the way it influences the light is it changes um, the angle of uh, how the light influences the camera. So, yeah, you know, there's a lot you can tweak. Um, I'm keeping it as is. Now, you can change these values as well. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is if you want these lights, for example, that I have in my materials to just by default have different colors, it's a lot more precise to actually go into the material and change the emission color than doing an overall bloom adjustment. Because as you can see, um, the moment we change to a different color, we're also really losing our um, the value, the brightness of our bloom. So I definitely recommend just changing that in a material and not having, um, you know, doing it like this, but that's up to you. We can add some textures as well, which basically have a, you know, type of dirty effect if it would be through a window. Not a big fan of that, but you know, it's nice that it's there at least. And the next thing, and also uh, the last thing for indoors that we're going to add here, um, is uh, lot color grading. Now, by default, Unity doesn't have that. Um, you know, color grading has its uh, has a lot of options here, and you can get pretty insane results if you play around with this. Um, but by default, it won't be in there. Now, I've added CS post. Uh, post-processing effects. I'll add a link in the description. Uh, there's so many of these types of assets out there. Uh, Beautify 2 being one of the most popular ones really. Now I do want to add that um, these a lot of these post-processing effects and assets work with default render pipeline and GRP. Um, uh, HDRP has its own uh, post-processing effects built in. It works slightly differently. So that's something to keep in mind. A lot of those assets won't work on HDRP and that's simply because HDRP does a lot of it itself already. Um, we'll see that with the next asset we'll be using after this as well. There's a lot of things that HDRP just already does built in. Now HDRP obviously does come with a uh, you know performance cost, but so do these assets. So something to keep in mind and balance for yourself. Now I'm using C, uh, uh, SC post-processing effects um, rather than Beautify because it's a lot lighter and has less performance impact. Beautify 2 is without a doubt the best one I've used, but it's also by far the heaviest I used. Um, I turned on uh, Beautify 2 um, with just a lot color grading in a VR project I'm using, for example, and I did the same with C, uh, this uh, asset. With Beautify 2 and only uh, lots turned on, the frame rate became too low, like, you know, had a huge impact. And with uh, this asset, I had literally no difference in performance. My frame rate was exactly the same. And sure, if you you know go down to the decimal, there might be a difference, but there's no doubt that Beautify 2, as good as it is, is also really, really heavy. So definitely keep that in mind. So a lot of talking about that, about those different assets, so let's actually have a look here. So um, these types of um, assets add tons of different types of uh, post-processing effects. Uh, a lot of them are really cool. Uh, a lot of them are really specific. Um, you know, a lot of them are even only really useful if you are using a uh, creating a first-person game, in my opinion. But 
you know, really cool nonetheless, some really great effects. Uh, but what we are going to use is um, quite simple. We are only going to use um, image and color grading LUT. Now there's a lot of sources where you can uh, get LUTs, you can create them yourself as well. Um, personally, what I did is I have the Amplify bundle and one of those was Amplify Color, which basically is a huge LUT pack. And I'm going to show you what this really does because, you know, it does a lot of different things. Uh, there we go. So let me lock this just to be sure. And as you can see, it's a, a pack with tons of different ones, like, you know, tons. Um, if I would just drop this in and, you know, I'll increase it to one. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious um, that this has a enormous impact on the way it looks. You can even go for um, stylized retro just to show you a bit, you know, what this does. And yeah, these completely change the color grading. Um, you know, you can use this for some uh, some really interesting things. Um, you know, really big uh, big impact on the look of your game, no matter how you look at it. Now, all of this is a bit too much for me, um, so I'm not going to use something like this. Um, but I used one of the default ones, um, and a couple of the default ones actually do have interesting looks. So if we turn this on or off. Um, you know, we have different types of color gradings and while a lot of this might seem a bit extreme or a bit too much, you know, keep in mind you can just alter the intensity, um, but it's something that's actually quite often used. Now, it might not be a lot per se and they just might manually be using color grading, but if you are in an icy environment, most likely the color grading will be adjusted for it to be more bluish, um, you know, white bluish. Uh, to really emphasize that you're in a cold environment. If you're in a desert, they'll be using a uh, you know bleached look, which is a bit brownish with a brownish tint, um, brown greenish. Uh, the Call of Duty games do this as well, for example. So it's you know it's something that has a big impact, and it shouldn't be used for an overall look for every single scene in your game. Um, it should really be adapted to what the type of scene you are using. So here I'm in space, so it has to be a bit dark and a bit blackish. Um, but on a planet, for example, um, I wouldn't be using this as it's, you know, it's too much contrast, really. So I use this one. Um, I think it's a nice look, just not this strong. So intensity is way too high. So I toned it down and just kept it to 0 0.2 just adds a bit more uh, contrast to the scene. It just, you know, works slightly better for me. Yes, the lights are even brighter um, like this, uh, but you know, I think it works. Um, and as you can see now that, um, you know, we have the other effects as well, we can actually turn on ambient occlusion. So having that off compared to um, 0 0.5 or one, um, actually makes one, well, it's a bit too extreme maybe. But we can crank up those values because we're overexposing a lot of other things. So, yeah, a couple of really uh, simple things. As you can see, most of this is built in, only that LUT color grading isn't. Uh, but there's so many different assets that will provide you this post-processing option. Um, I'll add everything I'm using in the description, but there are alternatives, um, you know, keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, the one I'm using, CS uh, Post Processing Stack, is also uh, not the most expensive asset. So definitely something interesting to keep in mind. It's tons of interesting effects. Now I do want to highlight one last default uh, look, well, even more than just one, um, which are really popular in games. Um, so it's something you know you could definitely have a look at. So we have Chromatic Aberration, which is um, really really popular. Um, in games and that's basically um, this type of effect and as you can see it's a bit blurred on the edges um, and it adds those you know the colors as you can see here the yeah you know red green bluish uh, this is really popular in games and for first person games I do get it um, because you know when you 
have a look at your own vision. Um, you know, not everything in your eyesight is sharp, so I kind of do understand that. Uh, for a third person game, I, I think it's simply just annoying. I'm not a big fan of it, the effect. Um, so I'm going to remove that. Um, another one which is quite often used and again was overused um, during a, you know, a certain amount of time in games was uh, Film Grain. Um, you know, I mentioned Mass Effect before and Mass Effect is one of the uh, <laughs> big, bigger examples of games that use that. Um, you know, it's, I mean, this is called grain, but in most games it's called film grain for a reason. It's supposed to mimic a bit the film grain effect you had in older movies. Um, you know, a touch of realism. Personally, I'm not, you know, a big fan of this. It's something that I always turned off in games myself. Um, but yeah, you can add it there and, you know, give your uh, players the option to turn it on or off. You know, might be useful. Um, and then one last one. Uh, which might be useful for certain aspects, one of the default ones, um, is definitely going to be uh, motion blur. And um, I'll have a talk about screen space reflections as well. So motion blur is, um, you know, absolutely useful um, for third person games mostly. Um, I know you'll see a lot of people talk about it, that they always turn it off in games. And I believe that they will in, you know, multiplayer games, first person, Call of Duty, etc. Because it literally gives you a slight disadvantage if you have it turned on. But if you are going to create a single player game, single player experience, motion blur just makes it look better when you turn the camera. Um, and it looks slightly more realistic because when you turn around fast, you know, you'll have a tight, uh, slight blur as well. So it's definitely something that, you know, I definitely put in there. Um, and have it as an option for the player. Now, one of the this is pretty easy to set up. It does have a performance impact, so keep that in mind. The other uh, blur um, effect we often have is a depth of field. Now, depth of field is a lot harder to really set up properly. Um, you can only see that in game. So, if I switch to the game vision, um, it's basically you know that it gets blurry at a distance. Um, but it's really hard to properly set this up so you'll have to play around with these values and tweak a lot before you'll get this right but it does look really nice if done well but that's the most important part you need to really do it well because i'm pretty sure you've played a game where depth of field wasn't done all that well and it's honestly just plain annoying so spend the time with this don't get uh, don't stop straight away if you get some negative results because yes it, it takes a while to really properly set this up but it is worth it if it's done right but yeah you'll need to check that in your uh, in your game view um what i definitely recommend if you want to try out depth of field is actually you know turn on play mode pause the game and then add depth of field and tweak those settings to see the effect it has it's really hard to check that uh in any other way and the last thing is screen, play, uh, screen space reflections and as you can see this effect only works with the default uh, rendering path um, which is you know a nice warning and I'm pretty sure I'm not using that in this one. Um, nope I'm not. I did try this out um, you know I did switch rendering paths to try this out didn't really have the effect I wanted it to have uh, there was a lot of reflection it didn't look great. I know it looks a lot better in HDRP, but this is a default render pipeline project and screen space reflections in um, you know HDRP just look completely different. So in HDRP it might be worth it. It really wasn't here. Um, so yeah, that's it in, uh, in terms of uh, post-processing effects. I know there's tons more that you can play around with. You know, we have the famous lens flare effects. Um, which can be really annoying if you are using Bloom like I am and you have a lot of lights here. You might get, um, you know, the lens flare effect with literally every little light you look at. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, you know, it might be a bit finicky. Now, the next thing we are going to be using, and I'm not going to set this up in this video because it simply takes too much time, but we'll have a look at, um, is... Um, Aura 2. 
Now, Aura 2 doesn't work um, for URP or HDRP. Um, they are working on a Aura 3, which will support URP as well. Uh, for HDRP, there's literally no point because um, what Aura 2 does is it adds volumetric lighting and volumetric fog. HDRP does that really well by default, so there's literally no point in uh, buying an asset for that. You know, it just gets done by default. Um, so if we turn that on, um, you know, we'll have this fog effect and it looks better when you're in play mode. And the way it is volumetric, because, you know, you might be thinking, well, I can just use, um, you know, post-processing effect that adds fog. But as you can see, the fog density gets brighter here and it goes up as well because there's an actual light source here. And that's what Aura 2 does. Um, so I'm going to turn on gizmos for, uh, gizmos for a moment. And I'm not really sure where all of my lights are in this sense, but we can have a look here. This is a uh, slightly easier one to do. So as you can see, um, you know, the, the fog um, gets influenced by the red light we have uh, up there. If I go into um, play mode, because some of the lights by default are turned off here, it will be uh, even clearer and we'll play around with those uh, with those settings a bit cool so I'm just going to keep my default character here and let's leave this space and go to the next room and I just want to highlight the effect aura has here on the, on all of the fog so I'm going to pause here and um, we'll have a look and as you can see I'm not sure how clear it is with YouTube's compression actually that's um, might be a slight different story but we have a lot of uh, fog here I have different volumes set up as well so um, I have a fog volume in this room which has a higher density um, I have a fog volume in this corridor and I did two small volumes to uh, to basically fill up the gaps and uh, Add one more to the last room, um, which is here, which has a crazy amount of fog. Um, this really depends on where it's useful. If you have a really big open world, um, you might just have one simple volume and that's it. And you know, with sunlight, um, having volumetric fog and lighting looks really great. Um, indoor spaces, it depends. Um, so it didn't make sense to have it in the entire space station. Um, I did think it was nice and pretty, um, but yeah, you you know, keep density in mind. As you can see, it's really dense here, and it gets a lot brighter around the lights, and it, you know, gets influenced by the lights. As you can see, the fog has different colors due to lighting as well. Looks really nice. Um, I definitely recommend having a look at Aura 2 if you are using default render pipeline. If you are using URP, um, you know, just wait until Aura 3 releases. I'm pretty sure that won't be... Uh, that will be quite soon. If you're using HDRP, all of this is built in. You don't need to buy an asset for that. Um, but it takes a bit more work to do it right, in my opinion. Um, Aura 2 is really you know, easy to use and really simple to use. But yeah, so that's it for this video. Um, I know there's tons of effects we went over and it might not even be a look you like at all and might be too dark or gritty for you. Um, but it might have been useful to see what all of the different post-processing effects do. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.